Welcome to the Triage Method Podcast with me, Gary McGowan, and my co-host, Mr. Patrick Farrell. Paddy, how are you this week? I am absolutely fantastic, Gary, especially considering the topic of conversation today, because it's basically an intersection of a whole host of worlds that I enjoy. I like to consider myself an amateur in a lot of these areas. And obviously I would like to consider myself an expert in this health and nutrition stuff, but it's basically a conglomeration of topics that I enjoy reading about or enjoy studying, whatever the fuck, you know? Um, so the topic, and you've probably seen after clicking into this podcast or searching it up or whatever, um, the topic of conversation is capitalism and obesity. Right. Um, and going into this conversation, as I was just saying to Gary before we came on air, it's like, I like when researchers, you know, give their conflicts of interest at the end of their paper. And, you know, I, I like when they do that because I'm like, I know what perspective you have coming into this. So I thought I would give my conflict of interest right now. And that is, first of all, that I'm heavily invested in all of these companies that we're going to be talking about. Pretty much all of them. I'm actually not invested in Coca Cola, Pepsi Man myself. Um, but pretty much every other one is a who's who of my fucking investment portfolio. So I'm coming from it with that perspective. You can call me a fucking shill if you want. Um, although I don't actually think my perspective lines up which with what is best for those companies, right? And um, I'm also right-leaning in my politics and you know my beliefs or whatever. And um, so that's the perspective that I view things through. I like to think that I can be objective, but... You know, maybe you don't think I'm being objective because your politics, ethics, whatever, are different to that. So coming into this conversation, Gary, do you have any conflict of interest to um, disclose? Yeah, so I'm not going to be sharing too much in this podcast, to be honest. I'll probably offer more in part two, where we'll talk more about the actual public health elements. So look, guys, I'm not going to pretend to be an economic expert or anything like that. Probably probably am I'm a little bit right-leaning, um, like Patty. Don't have any uh, investments in any of those companies. Um, so yeah, I, I, and again, my perspective would probably um, align with the opposing side that they have had in net negative on public health anyway in this conversation. So anyway, as we kind of get into this conversation, Patty, like what, what is capitalism? Like we're, we're talking to an audience and personal trainers here before we even get to any of the economic details. Like what do we mean when we say capitalism? All right. So th like, this is the thing, right? First of all, I'm going to say as well that I am definitely going to piss off historians. I'm definitely going to piss off uh, economists and <laughs> who else? Fucking, I don't know political commentators, whatever, right? Um, because I would consider myself an amateur in those areas. So don't take this as like, this is the be all definitive expert opinion on this. Like this is stuff that I would consider myself an amateur in. And it's just stuff that I've pieced together. I'd like to think that I'm well read on the topic, but of course I could be wrong, especially on you know, a historically, you know, a historical event or something. You know, I might say something that's like, this happened then and it actually happened five years beforehand or, you know, it was a different order or whatever, you know? Like, I'm not an expert on this stuff. However, I like to think that I have enough knowledge to put together a cohesive uh, structure of what's going on that leads up to the point that with the stuff that we actually wanted to discuss, which is the, the changing food environment and the obesity epidemic. And um, because if you've been listening to this whole series, like we've talked before about like, the socioeconomic status and obesity and how that's, you know, plays a role in the overall obesogenic, you know, environment. Um, and we have to understand, like, why did that come about, you know? And obviously, if we're talking about ec economics and we're talking about politics and that stuff just triggers people. So I'm sorry if something triggers you. Like, I, as I said, I gave my conflicts of interest. Like, so I probably do have a, a, a lens through which I'm viewing this stuff, right? Um, but I hopefully want you to come away from this going, that's interesting. I want to look more into that because ultimately, like I would like to be proven wrong or I'd like to have better information. So if you're able to provide that, happy days. Um, so that's the context of all this, right? Just giving my little disclaimer beforehand. Right, but rather than talking about capitalism, because people always think of capitalism as a certain thing. And I know I've, I've tar or I've whatever titled this podcast as capitalism and obesity. We don't actually want to talk about capitalism, right? Because anyone who is actually has any sense in terms of economics is probably going to argue that capitalism is the best system, right? And 
this is why, like, say, China, for example, the CCP have moved to a more capitalist system. And I say more capitalist system because obviously they're not a capitalist society, they're a communist society. However, the market itself is a phenomenal tool, right? And you would be stupid not to use it, right? And again, even though they're communists, and it's classically like, you know, the polar opposite, it's like communists versus capitalists, you know? Um, they're still like, this is a tool we should definitely use, right? And they do a lot of things, even though I don't agree with the government in a lot of areas, um, they do a lot of stuff that, you know, it actually makes a lot of fucking economic sense. Um, and they're, they're basically trying to get the best of both worlds. Now, you might argue that they're not doing that. Their treatment of certain minorities and stuff, you know, is definitely not ideal. Um, however, when people, especially in the West, talk about capitalism, you know, they generally talk about it from the the context of the current system, right? But that's not the only way you could run a capitalist society, right? That's not the only capitalist system. So you need to think of capitalism as the game, right? That's, it's the game we're playing, right? It could be football, right? And football is a good example, right? So we could be playing football and that's the game, capitalism, capitalism ball, whatever the fuck you want to call it, right? And neoliberalism is the specific rule set we're using to play that game, right? And what I mean by that is, like, we could all be playing football, but we could be playing five-a-side, you know? We could be playing five-a-side on, like, a, an enclosed astroturf, you know? The rules for that are different. Like, when are you going to do a throw-in? You're not going to do a throw-in because there's no boundary. It's not going to go out, you know? Um, same as, again, like, it's five-a-side, you know? It's different than if we were, had the, the full team, right? Um, you could be playing the rules in prison, right? Like, prison rules. You know, you've, you've heard that saying before where it's, like, these are prison rules, you know, like there's a little bit more uh, aggression allowed, right? Neoliberalism is probably, like neoliberalism is the rule set we're playing capitalism at the moment, right? And I'm talking about this from the perspective of the Anglosphere because there are a little bit of differences in terms of how other Western countries, um, and we'll call it the Anglosphere, which I mean by that is like English speaking countries, basically like fucking the remnants of the British Empire, right? And even though obviously that's not entirely true because, you know, we could talk about India and stuff and it's not the case. But you know what I mean? Like the English speaking countries that the British Empire spawned, right? And they run a certain type of capitalism at the moment anyway, and that is like neoliberal capitalism or neoliberalism, right? And the reason it's called neoliberalism is because it spawns from the liberalism um, in terms of like classical liberalism, which is economic liberalism, not the current day like liberals, right? It's classic liberalism, which is kind of like um, Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, like the founding of America, that kind of shit, you know, where it's like, we would, we would probably call them libertarian today, you know, if we were to categorize them, right? So that's where the liberalism comes. And then the neo part comes from because it's the new version of that, you know, it's new liberalism, right? That's what we're, we're kind of looking at now. It's like neoliberalism, new liberalism. Again, that's, that's what we're, we're, we're coming from. Right. Um, and where am I saying? Yeah. So basically I always anal analogize neoliberalism to prison rules. That's why I brought that up because it's really rough. Right. But like, if you are able to be really rough, like, the potential to score more goals obviously goes up. Like if I can just deck the goalkeeper, knock him out, like fuck, I can score goals easy. Right. So it is a very rough system in terms of people get left behind. Right. But capitalism doesn't need to be that way. And also it wasn't that way previously. Right. And it was still a capitalist society. And also when people look back and they're like the idyllic, like, Oh, capitalist society, blah, blah, blah. Like even if you talk to, conservatives or you know people on the right they all yearn for you know oh it was better back in the day you know and they all yearn for this kind of like 1950s americana right like that's the kind of vibe you know and uh, 1950s american you know wholesome household all that that's the kind of vibe they like right that was still a capitalist society but it wasn't a neoliberal society right like neoliberalism just it fucking didn't exist and we'll come to the timeline in a second right um so even though they're, they're pining for something, they're, they're, they're talking about it in a way now where they're arguing against the rules that led to that society, right? They're arguing for the rules that moved us away from that society. Like literally neoliberalism started to come into the fore in the, the 60s and 70s, you know? So it's like this, and there's a few reasons for that, which we'll, we'll come to. Um, and as I said, like it's, it's 
it's funny when you when you start seeing these things and you start looking at other people's conversations like if say i'm, I'm uh, again like i would be considered a capitalist like that's what i like and um, it's funny seeing how other people argue against their own position or their own actual end outcomes and we'll come to that in a second but basically that's in a nutshell where neoliberalism comes from right and to give it more flesh in terms of like what actually is neoliberalism because i know i've said it like 50 times already and haven't really given a definitive you know definition of it and um, basically in a neoliberal regime state policy is orientated or oriented to promote the interests of finance capital and ceases to defend and promote the interests of the people right and um, they're more concerned with inflation than unemployment or individual happiness and health right like it's all about inflation and this is why you'll see especially in certain publications and um, that all they'll talk about is inflation like oh if we print more money it'll lead to inflation which is again like it's a valid concern and we'll, we'll come to why those concerns are valid in, in a historical perspective and um, but that's that's their concern they don't really care about unemployment like literally the state could have 20 percent unemployment as long as they kept below their fucking two percent inflation rate they wouldn't really fucking care you know and um, that's a neoliberal regime right and um, because that's the, their interests lie with finance capital right and britain is a great example of this because basically it has no fucking industry anymore like since the industrial revolution like there is no industry except like you have to wonder why britain as a small european country like let's be realistic it's a small european country like why does it have the second largest stock exchange or financial sector i should actually say in the world you know the first one is like the new york and the second one is in london like that's that's a little bit wild when you consider it. it's like this is actually a very small country right like this is like why isn't it in germany like why isn't it in china like what like obviously it's not in china for a reason but you know like why isn't it in somewhere else now obviously some of this is historical in terms of like britain literally ruled the world at some stage um and that, that obviously plays a huge role in this but even still it's like this like their goals are clearly going to be keeping that sector running smoothly because you know it's not it's not in their best interest as an economy to you know favor industry or favor you know making people happier or individuals or whatever because they don't make the the money right like the, the money they make in the country is from the finance sector like the financials right um, and there's actually some if you really look into it it's some like really fucking like screwy stuff in terms of like because england has basically had 400 years of continuous like financial success and um, like well depending on who you ask um but basically um other european wealthy like aristocrats and stuff they all store their money even american aristocrats or whatever you want to call them and um, they stay, store their money in britain because they have a long track record. No other country has that track record of, of like financial stability that Britain has, right? And that's that's one of the main reasons. It's like all these other wealthy people are putting their money into British financial sector because of its stability, right? So they're not really incentivized to change the policy at all. That's the perspective. It doesn't matter what fucking government comes in, left, right, fucking authoritarian, fucking... Uh, whatever libertarian i suppose down below it's like none of them are going to change that system because that's that's the only system that's working in britain you know unless they heavily fucking dropped the, the price of the pound you know and um, like it's not coming back like their industries are not coming back the industrial revolution is not coming back you know the only way it could come back is like we're, technically we're in the fourth industrial revolution in case anyone's keeping track and um, with i know everyone always thinks of like we've only had one industrial revolution but we have actually had three already which is one of the industrial revolutions was the one that we all think about in terms of like you know industrial revolution britain and um, and that's like you know the mechanization and fucking all that kind of stuff but the second one was uh, it depends on who you ask but basically like second and third one were like the the telegram so mass communication and the other one then was standardization because it's all great and well being able to work in your factory but you need to standardize things and as soon as you get that standardization like that blew up industry like you think of like henry ford in america like just standardized all the parts standardized all the fucking things so it wasn't just you know individuals making things it was 
here's your nuts and bolts. You fucking put them in here. It's like all the nuts and bolts are standardized. There's all, like everything standardized. Anyway, that's beside the point. We're basically living through the fourth industrial revolution if you are to believe it. Um, we potentially are also living through the fifth industrial revolution um, in terms of like cryptocurrency and stuff. But look, that's beside the point. I'm getting off track. Um, other components of a neoliberal regime, which you'll, you'll note, um, are like the mass sell-off of industry right? And the classic example is not actually like Britain or America or anything like that. The classic example is actually Russia because they moved away from that, you know, communist, like the fall of the communist regime, the USSR, um, like fell and they basically moved to the worst kind of neoliberalism, right? Um, like they moved to a system where they basically mass wholesale sold off nationalized industry, right? Um, and massively enriched all of these oligarchs, right? You know, that's where all those oligarchs in Russia come from. Like, they're basically like, oh, your man's mate, or, you know, he knew, knows a guy, he's good, like, he has a bit of money, you know, you know, basically we'll, we'll look after him, right? Um, and they would literally say, for example, they would have, like, coal industry. They would just sell it to a guy really cheap, even though it was worth way more, um, and then he would just own all the fucking coal industry in russia you know or steel or fucking whatever it is right like reckless shit right so like people think like oh neoliberalism is bad like it could be worse <laughs> like it could be far worse um but anyway look russia is the best example however like this stuff still goes on in like say england for example like they, there's still talk of like you know the nhs they want to be oh like put it out to let, let some company buy it you know and again there's pros and cons to that now i actually personally am not for that even though like I would be on the right. And um, I actually think like a national healthcare service makes sense. Like I, yeah, ideally I'd like it to run efficiently. And I don't think most national healthcare services run efficiently, especially not the Irish one. Sorry to any Irish doctors that are out here. Like I know people that literally work inside the lower rungs of the national health service here in Ireland. And uh, they're just like, man, I have like five managers and my manager manages this other manager that manages this other manager. Like it's just bloated middle management. And they're like, there's no need for this. But anyway, look, that's, that's a tangent, a discussion for another day. <laughs> um, but just to contrast that in terms of like, people will listen to that and go, oh, well, these neoliberals selling off national, you know, you know, companies and services, like that's, that's not ideal, right? That's not what we want. We want to have some national, you know, services and industries. And you have to remember that there is, there are political ideas, ideals that do this, namely fascism, Nazism, communism, right? And um, socialism, whatever you want to call it. And they, they obviously advocate for that as well. Um, and like, especially with fascism, like, and Nazism, like they're very much into like, well, you could term it corporatism, where like the state is heavily involved in um, industry, right? So it, rather, it's, it's this kind of like quasi- private public thing like that's basically somewhat what um china are doing you know like for example like jack ma literally he's the guy who did alibaba and all that and um, he criticized the chinese government and he's literally been in hiding as of this recording for like the last fucking 12 weeks <laughs> you know so like reckless shit um but also we have to remember that like well, first of all i want you to remember from that that it's not an argument of either or it's like oh yeah go for um get rid of these from being under the national books that's great and you have like oligarchs right that would be like somewhat what a neoliberal person would want and um, and then we also have this like oh nationalize these things uh, a state-run economy is going to be a better run economy right and like just question yourself with that and we'll come back to like why people question that and and for like stuff anyway later on in the podcast um but just question your beliefs your ideas around that because they might actually be the beliefs of like fascists, Nazis, communists. Like, do you just need to think about that a little bit deeper in terms of what would happen if we did actually like nationalize all these industries, right? However, I also want to caveat that with under times of duress, stress, whatever, such as war, like Britain nationalized its industries. Like they were all just fucking building planes and tanks and fucking shit, you know? And America did as well, even though they like to pretend they didn't. Like they're like, oh, well, like, no, we still let you do this. Like they basically sold like war contracts, which you know, basically started this fucking military industrial complex. And they sold war comp contracts. And like, again, like you have stuff like Henry Ford and stuff, even though he was a pacifist and he was like totally against war. And like they were buying, like he was making fucking, you know, 
armaments. He was fucking converting his industries to make this shit, which is also interesting as well, because people always talk about the opposite side of things. And you have to always remember like the historical context and the actual facts of the matter when we discuss political parties and political systems and historical situations. Because first of all, America basically saved the world twice, but also so did Britain. And we'll, we'll come to that in a second. Um, but also you have to realize that these, like America especially was in bed with the communists in Russia. Like people talk about, oh, the Russian uh, war machine, like they literally gave so many people, you know, to the war cause, like both wars. Um, but also you have to remember that it was American food in their bellies, right? First of all, right? You also have to remember that, like it literally was American food, like it came from America, you know? And you also have to remember that the industries in Russia, not only were they designed by Americans, like literally Russia was like, oh, Americans, you were good at this, come over and help us make our industry. They were literally built by Americans, right? Like they would literally assemble factories in America, ship them over to Russia and assemble them there, or they'd go over and assemble them like proper, like titans of capitalism that you'd be like, oh, like, this is great. You know, like these are great people, Andrew Carnegie and everything, like completely in bed with all that shit, right? In terms of like building industry, like the Russian industrial complex that, you know, was later used for proper like communism. Well, I say later, it was fully used during the time for communist activities and in, in such as like gulags and stuff. And, um, but that all that industry was built with American hands and American ingenuity, you know? So like people are like, oh, well, you know, if we switch to a communist regime, like we might have the same prosperity that Russia supposedly did, even though, you know, a huge amount of cooking the books went on, which, you know, probably happens in fucking all systems realistically. Um, but also it wasn't Russian ingenuity that built that industry. It was American hands, American ingenuity, right? Um, so you with me so far, Gary? Yes, sir. Anything, to, you. anything to interject on that? I know I'm literally laying a fucking a lot of groundwork and you with this yeah, is supposed to be healthy so I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna keep i'm just gonna come back with questions as if like i'm a personal trainer i listen to the triage podcast to learn about nutrition so like what could you could you make clear like what what do you mean when you say like communism if that's not something people are familiar with i don't know if i could make that clear without being uh, politically incorrect gary <laughs> that's totally fine <laughs> basically like as far left as you can be an authoritarian left-wing state right so like it basically uh people's like the workers party if that makes sense right like it's for the working class they're they're that's who the communists are supposed to anyway supposed look after, to. right that's not necessarily how it works out in the end and it's the same with the the right i'm not saying that's fucking better on the the right either but i'm just saying that's who it's supposed to be it's supposed to be the workers party you know um anyway before we descend into fucking anarchy here. <laughs> um, there's a lot going on there, right? Now, people also advocate, there's a little thing in here that people sometimes equate neoliberalism with laissez-faire, right? A term like laissez-faire, which is, you know, it, it kind of sounds like lazy, right? And maybe there's the same root word there fucking in the romance languages, whatever the fuck. Um, but basically that is a proper hands-off system, no rules. Like that's, although I'm saying like neoliberalism is prison rules like laissez-faire is literally just fucking we were supposed to be playing fucking soccer and you just started playing rugby you know and um, like there's even though you people equate it with the the right and like capitalism and stuff like it's just as easy that that could be in a, a left-wing society right and um, and the classic example of this laissez-faire well first of all the classic individual who pro, a proponent of it in america especially and um, was ayn rand and um, but that's we'll come back to that in a second and um, but this system like it doesn't work. Like I've talked about this stuff before um, on the podcast a few times and a few different things. Like if you actually had a laissez-faire system, like what's going to stop me? Like I have literally just seven males in my family and not including like, like everyone in my family has fucking huge families, right? And 12, 10, whatever meant kids, right? Like what is to stop me and all of my relatives just being like, look, we're all males here. I'm just going to fucking take whatever the fuck I want. Nobody's going to stop us because there's a huge amount of six foot odd, hundred kilo males like what are you gonna do you know and um, and that's basically every man for himself laissez-faire that's that's the fucking 
the system, right? And again, it doesn't work. Like the, the classic example of an actual laissez-faire system is a lot of failed states in Africa with, again, the, the classic example being Somalia, you know, the fall of the Syed Bar regime in 1991, like yeah, just before I was born, 91, I think. Um, and like, that's, that's what a true laissez-faire system looks like, right? And um, like, literally we're talking like pirates on the high seas, men just out to get whatever the fuck they can get you know it's like i don't there's no rules right that's a that's a laissez-faire system and some people think that oh well if we had a laissez-faire system in like you know the developed world i know you're not supposed to say developed world and developed and developing but you know what i mean and if we had that in like these western countries like it wouldn't be like that but i can guarantee you it would be like that like there's if there was no rules like you're not going to have a life like it's not going to be an enjoyable life right because i know 100% there is nothing to stop bands of men just (laughs) taking whatever the fuck they want. (laughs) Um, So yeah, like a laissez-faire system is is not ideal, even though it kind of gets lumped in with neoliberalism. Like it's it's not the same thing. Like laissez-faire is no rules. Neoliberals, even though they sometimes say like, oh, let's deregulate this and, you know, unregulate this industry and regulation is the stuff that holds us back. Like that's, that's, they don't actually mean that entirely, right? Like they mean that in certain circumstances, they don't want to actually have a laissez-faire system because it wouldn't be beneficial for them either, you know, because nobody's spending money when there is roving fucking bands of men with machetes in the streets, you know? <laughs> so like there's that, that's not a, a preferable system either, even though they kind of get lumped together, right? Um, Cause like, again, like you think about it, like, the neoliberalism it's all about that finance capital it's all about how can we move money around right and again there's differences between like anglo neoliberalism and then what we'll call austrian neoliberalism and i'll explain why it's called austrian neoliberalism in a second um, and there's differences between those two but the basic this the same thing is they want to promote finance capital the movement the free movement of finance capital and what i mean by that is like the free movement of money right well i say they want they they say they want to promote the free movement of money but they're also incredibly scared of cryptocurrency because that actually gives the people the ability to free move money without the intervention of this third party a bank which is again an outdated anyway that's beside the point um so there, there are differences right and i don't want people to consider neoliberalism and if you do currently consider neoliberalism and you're on the right especially and laissez-faire as being similar systems and you need to go back and do your homework right and if you're on the left and you're like looking at this going listening to this again like as i said i have my own biases like if you're on the left and you're looking at this and you equate those two systems like again you've got homework to do in terms of understanding the differences between those two systems right and again as i said like this is a fucking health and fitness podcast like i'm not a fucking politician an economist or anything like that um you can definitely find better resources, better podcasts that dive deeper into this stuff, right? And I just want to give this kind of brief, I say brief, but this overview of this stuff so that we have the groundwork laid for further discussions in the future about the actual stuff we care about on this podcast, at least. Like I obviously care about this stuff. Um, But anyway, right. So that's just kind of some, I'll call them definitions and stuff like that. And now I want to just move on to a bit more of the historical context, because this definitely lays the groundwork for what we actually want to discuss, which is, you know, the, the, the nutrition transition, the changing food environment. Um, and we'll probably wrap it up at the end of this. Like we're just going to do a part one here. Um, and then we'll probably wrap it up at the end of this kind of discussion and then really start diving deep into the nutrition transition. We'll talk about America, Britain, and we'll actually talk about China as well. Because as I said at the start of this, like they have effectively tried to get the best of both worlds in terms of a neoliberal um, regime under a communist regime, right? We'll, we'll talk about that in the future, right? Um, but there's basically three people that I want to introduce. Well, I, I've already introduced the fourth that we could kind of introduce, which is Ayn Rand. Um, and I'm not going to actually speak a lot about Ayn Rand, right? And Ayn Rand is actually a female, just in case anyone was wondering, because I know that's not exactly like a, a female name, a prototypical one in Ireland anyway. Um, but she was she was in there, right? She had the, the belief in the great man hypothesis in terms of like she was a laissez-faire laissez-faire person um, and she was like oh we should worship these titans of industry because they're the ones that'll get us through like if she was around today she'd be like oh elon musk baby you're great jeff bezos you're great you know like that kind of thing she's like 
these w top one percenters of the one percent she's like they're the ones with the ideas they're the ones with fucking everything we need to protect them at all costs we need to enable them at all costs you know and um, again you can clearly see that there's some flaws with that thinking <laughs> um, yeah she she did also um i think grow up in the soviet union herself so you can see how like the pendulum can totally swing if you came from that perspective that like once you see like oh american capitalism you're like yeah let's fucking take it all and there's there's lots of other examples actually there's actually an even better example here in frederick or friedrich hayek which is who i'll introduce in a second because he's actually the one that laid the framework for this neoliberalism um which is really important to understand and um, but yeah there's there's loads of things where you'll see that where people go they grow up in a certain system and because that system was inefficient for them or not working they'll push for a different system if they're in a democratic country like they'll be like oh i grew under like say, actually a california in america is fucking ideal case study for this where you have people literally growing up under capitalism and having boatloads of fucking cash like their parents are rich paid for their college everything and um, they go to college and they basically become communists and it's like oh we should have a communist and we look after people and it's never for those people i'm obviously not putting everyone throwing everyone under the bus yeah. either in california or just as a as a political ideology like the left but you'll see those particular ones like they basically they don't have a looking down mentality in terms of like, they're not looking down at the people below them in terms of how they could help them. They're all looking up in terms of like, Oh, these people have more than me. I, I deserve more. Right. Which is completely un antithetical, antithetical, whatever the fuck that word is. And um, to the actual left message, you know, which is just ironic because these are also the people with, you know, iPhones, the fucking free time to be on Twitter and fucking put their opinions point, uh, across. So you, you get this distorted view of what the left actually believes because you have these people that are basically not working class people um, and not the people that would benefit from an overthrow of the, the capitalist system. And um, like, for example, like the classic way to think about this is like, there's a reason why these people talk about like, oh, eat the rich, right? Like they're, they're talking about eat the rich. They're not talking about feed the poor, right? So that you can see the, the shift, those two perspectives, you know, in terms of like people who are actually on the left that, you know, want to help the less fortunate, like they're never going to say eat the rich. You know, they might believe that, okay, we actually need to, there's some wealth inequalities here. We need to fix this. Um, but they're not going to be advocating for the complete overthrow and, you know, oppression of these other people, right? They're like, okay, can we just spread the wealth a little bit, right? They're looking below them. They're going, look at these people. There's homelessness here. There's fucking whatever here. And um, these people are oppressed. We need to actually look after them, right? They're looking down in terms of, I don't mean that in a, a bad way, like you're looking down on people, but they're looking down the social hierarchy, socioeconomic status. And they're going, look, there's people getting left behind, right? Obviously, again, like as I'm saying, like this caricature of like California, you know, white liberal, where it's like, eat the rich, they're fucking tweeting it out on their iPhone while they're sipping on their fucking cappuccino, whatever, macchiato, frappuccino thing, concoction from Starbucks while they're waiting for their avocado and toast, you know, like that kind of vibe. Like that's, again, unfortunately what you see on stuff like Twitter, where it basically is a caricature of the actual beliefs. I say the actual, like, again, like, well, it's ethereal. It's not fucking, it's wishy-washy. Like what's the right beliefs? What's the, the left beliefs? What's the communist beliefs? Like it's, it's wishy-washy, you know? Um, but again, it's a, it's a caricature, right? And I don't like, I don't like, like while it's easy and it's fun to like straw man these arguments in, in both sides, like I, I fucking, like I follow a lot of uh, pages on like Facebook and Instagram that just, you know, rip the piss out of every fucking political idea whenever there's like hypocrisy and fucking whatever else. And like, I really like that. Cause first of all, it exposes you. You're just like, oh, actually I thought that I believe that. I see there's actually some hypocrisy there. Like, I, I like that. You know, I know a lot of people don't like that because, you know, you basically have to kill your own fucking sacred cows and that's never fucking, you know, a nice experience. But anyway, look, we're getting off track, right? Um, there's a few people I want to introduce, which is the first one is John Maynard Keynes, which, you know, literally there's probably five British people that fucking changed the world, right? And John Maynard Keynes is one of them, right? And... Um, and he definitely doesn't get the hype that he fucking deserves because he was a fucking genius, right? He was, I think, president of the treasury um, in Britain at like fucking 21 or 22, you know, which uh, that's unheard of today, but that's because, well, first of all, like we live in a society where like fucking the two political parties in America, like they could literally put forth fucking septuagenarians, like fuck people in their 70s, you know? Like imagine being in your 20s and being like, I'm the head of the fucking... 
I don't know, the IMF, you know, or like I'm the head of the fucking World Health Organization or something, you know, like th- that's just not happening. Like people are like, oh no, you need to be, like imagine being a CEO of a fucking billion euro or billion dollar company and being like, oh, I'm 21. Like that obviously does happen sometimes in terms of like you come up with this fucking groundbreaking technology or something, but like realistically, you're not getting appointed as a CEO as a 21 year old, right? But John Maynard Keynes, fucking genius. He was, right? He's actually the one that advocated for Britain, which again, this is why I said earlier on, Britain literally saved the world twice um, along with America. Like he's the one that advocated for the loans or like basically got Britain to vouch for the loans of France and Italy in uh, World War I um, and to, to, pay, to finance the war. Um, and both of those countries did not pay back their loans, just in case anyone was wondering. So Britain picked up the tab for those. Um, so again, their money, British money, saved the fucking world. Um, and it, the reason he really came to prominence and like got astro, astronomical fame um, was because he was actually invited to the Treaty of Versailles, I believe, if I'm correct. Um, and he also was like, oh, look, he's the one that saw that if you fucking punished the, uh, a, a strong, intelligent country in the center of Europe, um, the way that they were punished in the Treaty of Versailles. And he was like, this is not going to lead to proper, you know, well, well, he wrote a paper on it or maybe a book on it. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but he basically predicted that this is only going to lead to another war or this is only going to need lead to um, some sort of like dictatorship in this country, right? So he got a huge amount of fame from that because obviously he was proven right. Like firstly, in a, in uh, Germany, like the, the uh, this quasi, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Let's, it was a female again, I think. Um, this quasi socialist communist party came to prominence first. Um, and that's like the those puts, puts can't even fucking speak German, obviously. Um, but that's where like Hitler and all, stu- all those like came to power when they started having all those, like he was, he was hired to spy on these, you know, political dissident parties, right? And then he was like, oh, these guys are actually speaking my language, you know? And that's why he rose, he rose in one of these like fucking whatever political parties. But anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Um, so John Maynard Keynes predicted that. He knew that, when, like he was like, this is going to happen. And I should say like John Maynard Keynes, fucking genius. I don't know why people on the right, if you were thinking of this politically, I don't know why people don't advocate for his politics because he was literally a gay man for half his life. Like he literally used to have gay sex with multiple men, had a little fucking book of all the people he had sex with and who he would like to have sex with, you know? So very liberal in terms of his, uh, I don't know what you call it, social beliefs, I suppose. Um, And like... He was also a member of the Bloomsbury Group, um, which I don't know if you know much about this. I know you're very uncultured, Gary. Um, but they were basically like people that made like, you know, fucking paintings and stuff, Virginia Woolf and stuff. Um, and they were in like King's College. Like he basically made King's College all their money, right? Um, but they are basically a group of people in North London, I believe. I don't fucking know London geography. Um, but he was basically the one that made them all the money. He was like, fuck, I can just make money on fucking out of anything like he lost all his money in the 1929 um financial crash made it all back by 1931 like fucking good man like he was on heads head of boards like people wanted him like literally prime ministers and stuff they used to fucking ask for his audience because they were like here like tell us some fucking stuff how should we fucking run the economy right um so really fucking smart guy and i'll come to like what his fucking like his contribution in a second i just want to give more historical context um but basically he again also advocated for the loans for the second world war who again all the other countries that they got loans they reneged on and britain was left with the tab and not only was it left to fucking free france again um but anyway look that's a beside the point um rural britannia and all that um but he was a really intelligent guy I should actually just say a bit more on that Bloomsbury group because it's actually quite interesting. Like literally they were all just like, they were a group of Oxford, Oxford, I think I want to say Oxford um, guys who were all like pals and all their sisters as well. Like they basically were hopping in and out of each other's beds. Like it was basically like a, a sex cult or something, right? Like real fucking weird, but that's what he was fucking interested. So this guy, John Maynard Keynes, literally fucking interesting life, but also really fucking politically astute. And he's basically the one that came up with macroeconomics. Like 
economics was an individualistic pursuit back in before him like he taught like before that like especially from like adam smith wealth and nations all that kind of stuff like it was very much like let's look at the individual and what outcomes uh, arise because of what an individual wants john maynard keynes was like no we need to look at this macro came up with macroeconomics and he basically showed that economics was a mathematical science rather than a uh psychological science i suppose like obviously there is parts of both but he was like this is the fucking underlying maths of it right um and I'll, again i'll come to some of his you know beliefs in a second um should i go for it mm, yeah so basically again he was the guy smart guy fucking made up macroeconomics he was basically suggested that governments should and this is we somewhat do this now and it, it, Keynesian economics was kind of put to the wayside after the 1970s. Like people were like, oh, it's dead. It doesn't work, right? In the 1960s, 1970s, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, but basically his postulate was like, you know, like people in employment is the most important thing, right? Like he personally believed that the British pound was pegged too high, you know, which discouraged industry from going to Britain because like I can get it cheaper from China, you know? Um, so he was in favor of like, you know, effectively debasing the currency, like bringing it down in value. And um, which again, I think Britain has done three times in the last hundred years, you know, which is you know beneficial. Um, and this is again, like why something like the, the EU and their Euro is not beneficial for all the countries in there. For example, Greece, like Greece, what they need to do right now is just fucking debase their currency so that industry can go to Greece, you know? Um, and they've obviously had some fucking terrible decisions in terms of like austerity and stuff like that. I, Ireland did that as well. Um, but that's what they need to do. But obviously they can't because we have the Euro and you can't just go, oh, Greece needs to debase the fucking entire European country or currency. And um, like, that's not going to happen. Germany is not going to let that happen, right? And um, so Greece is just going to left, be left flounder unless they come up with some fucking creative uh, accounting in terms of how they fucking tax their things to incentivize people to come into their country, you know? Like maybe they'll sell off an island or something to fucking Amazon or something. I don't fucking know, you know? Like there is talk of that that type of shit, you know? Um, because imagine, like, imagine you're just Amazon. You're just like, oh, I could buy an island and have no... Buy EOS. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, but they'd have no regulation then because it's like, this is my own island. Like, I'm not... This is, I, you know? Um, so it would make sense, right? Um, but anyway, he basically advocated for borrowing money at the bottom of an economic cycle. So when money is cheap, when people want to lend money, and he advocated, do, like, the government doing jobs that the industry is not willing to do or they can't do because you know they don't have the money to do it or whatever you know so he was an advocate of that you know so basically he had uh, the idea of the multiplier effect which was later mathematized by one of his students and um, I, I wish i could remember his name but i can't um but it was mathematized and basically the multiplier effect is like oh if the government spends money here to keep people in employment and again you're looking at the coronavirus response like we're somewhat doing this although like I think he would actually be against the way we've done it now because, you know, you still have to account for supply and demand. And we've basically brought in some Keynesian policies such as giving people, you know, free money um, while also not allowing them to spend, which, you know, I think he would be completely against because the reason he advocated giving people money was so they could spend money because that keeps the economy afloat, you know? Whereas like right now it's like, you're not allowed to spend your money except on these fucking mega corporations, transnational fucking corporations like Amazon and stuff where it's like, this is not helping the economy, <laughs> you know? Um, but anyway, look, that's, that's an aside. But basically he was like, yeah, look, it's all about the jobs, the multiplier effect. If the government spends a euro or a dollar or a fucking pound here, you know, they pay these people to build roads and the people that are being paid to build the roads or this fucking national industry, whatever it is, like basically essentially centrally planned economy, you know, like you have stuff in America when they started doing stuff like this, like um, for a, a classic example is a completely useless road, right? Route one, highway one down America, down the fucking left side of America, useless in terms of economic stuff like nothing travels that way. There's fucking sea right beside you. That's far more efficient, right? But it has given, hundreds of people you know great like i drove down it during fucking last summer or fucking the summer before i fucking don't even know what year it is anymore you know um but like gave great use to that so like basically he was an advocate of like even if it's not perfectly useful right now like if it is useful in the future or it keeps people in jobs right now like that's a benefit to the economy because if i pay this worker here this construction worker to build this road he pay goes home 
pays the fucking grocery store money in the grocery store, pays this other person money. And this, you know, goes on like that. And again, that's the multiplier effect that he had. So he was an advocate of the, the government spending money when the economy, like the business cycle was, was at its bottom. Right. And then he also advocated like stopping spending that money when you're at the top of that business cycle. So basically spend the money when the businesses are not willing to spend their money. Right. Because, you know, we're in an economic slump. Right. So the government comes in, spends the money, gets the fucking economy like keeps it going. And then once we're on a nice upward trajectory, stop spending that money, ratchet it back down and let the economy, let the business cycle take care of that. Right. Now, Hayek is against that. I'll just come I'll come back to Hayek in a second, but I just want to say that he's against that because he would say like that just distorts the the price market, right? So you start and you end up like, again, it's happening right now in terms of like you end up supporting ghost companies, right? Like financially non-viable companies because, and you just end up giving them money um, to keep them going during this bottom of the, the economy. And like as soon as the economy starts going up and the government turns off the tap with that money, those companies are going to fail anyway. Right. And that's what Hayek would say to that. Like you're distorting the market, distorting this price mechanism because these companies are not valid companies. Right. However, as I said, Keynes is more, more interested in employment. Right. That's what he cares about. He cares about people being employment, people having a job and being able to spend their money as a result of having their job. Like he was like, spend, spend, spend. Right. And he has lots of ideas that, we would take for granted, especially if you're on the right. Like, for example, he was an advocate of like getting more cash in people's hands. And he would say stuff like, you know, the fastest way to get cash in people's hands and keep them productive is just do tax cuts, right? Like, again, you talk about austerity or you talk about like the lower classes not having enough money or whatever. Like, a solution is simple in terms of what Keynes would advocate. He would say something like, just stop taxing them. You know, like if you're paying, 21% tax or whatever the fuck and you're only earning I don't know fucking 20 grand like you get more money if you just don't have to pay that tax right so straight away in your pocket keeps you a productive member of society he would also advocate which I'm not necessarily as much of an advocate of like giving people money he was also an advocate of like social ho- social housing social uh, medicine and stuff like that um, and what's interesting which we'll come to it Hayek was also an advocate of social housing and social medicine even though he's basically the the poster child for the american system and he actually argued against the american system and they've yeah basically they they they, they fucking worship hayek because he's all like you know free market capitalism and um, but if they if you actually read hayek or friedrich von mises which is like you know where it comes from basically like um he would like he was pro social housing and pro um socialized medicine um, but anyway that's that's an aside right so that's um john maynard keynes right so he basically got britain and america because everyone started following this fucking policy after he fucking advocated and um, basically he made of macroeconomics and obviously i'm giving like the briefest of overviews of fucking macroeconomics because there's no way i can just describe everything in fucking macroeconomics because first of all i don't understand everything because i'm not an economist and second of all I want to wrap this up in under an hour and a half (laughs) Um, and I'm not going to cover an entire fucking science in an hour and a half. Right. And, but basically that's his fucking contribution. He understood the economy, made fucking boatloads of cash, fucking on the stock market, basically trading currencies and stuff, which I also do. um, Cause it's, it's fun. Um, But made boatloads of cash with that was a great fucking advocate of, employment which i'm also a very big advocate of because i think it gives people meaning to their lives in terms of like i'd rather see you have a job be productive and have purpose and meaning like actually going somewhere rather than just giving you free money and having you sit at home like like you just think of like the coronavirus stuff right now where people are just forced to sit at home and they get their whatever 350 per week like i know so many people that are just like like they, they tell you that they they feel unproductive they feel like they're right now it's like they've lost all confidence in themselves in terms of being able to work they're like i can't focus for more than five minutes you know i don't think that's a a good way to run society you know now again that's not to say that something like you know a social net you know the dole or something is not a bad or is a bad thing and but again i don't think that's a good long-term solution but again that's my perspective you fucking could be completely wrong you might completely disagree with it right and so does that give you an overview of Keynes so far Yes, sir. Keep going. Right. Now we're going to move to Hayek, which this is the stuff that we talk about here, like 
some of this stuff literally sounds like I'm talking about fucking conspiracy theories, right? But it's actually true, right? But first of all, so Friedrich Hayek was born in Austria, right? For, I, think, I actually think he was in the Air Force in World War One. But anyway, I think he fought for the Austro-Hungarian Empire with Germany against the fucking allies, if you will, uh, against the West um, during the First World War. Um, but again, Austria, you have to think about this, as we said earlier on, like you can see how some people come to because they go through one system or they grow up in one system and then they go to the total opposite of that system or they have a real fear of that system like we talked about Ayn Rand and stuff, right? Um, but Friedrich Hayek grew up in Austria and he said, like, he, when he was growing up in, in Vienna, I believe, um, he said that you could hear the printing presses at night printing money and by the time it got to the streets in the morning, like, it's worthless, right? Because they had hyperinflation after that World War One, which is, like, Friedrich Hayek was actually a... A, a fanboy of John Maynard Keynes because again John Maynard Keynes said this about Austria, Hungary and fucking Germany in terms of like if you do this it'll lead to hyperinflation whatever um, so Hayek was like oh man John Maynard Keynes got it fucking right right which I actually think is what inspired him partly anyway to get into economics um, but anyway look that's beside the point or maybe he was in it beforehand I'm not really sure on the timeline there um, but you can see then further on he was a um, I studied uh, economy, uh, economics in Austria, right? And the Austrian economics or economists, they believe more so in watching inflation than employment, as I said at the start, right? That's where that comes from. They also have a very strong distrust of government, which this that's something important, 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 important to remember later on, especially in the 70s and stuff. Um, so he was invited to Britain after like in the interlude between the two wars. And um, he was invited to, again, I think it was King's College. That's where fucking the, the Keynesians were. Um, and to like, you know, talk about Austrian economics, you know, because obviously, again, you want fucking dialogue in different economic thoughts, right? And he cared way more about inflation, right? Because again, you think about it, like he grew up in the streets where they were printing fucking hundreds of fucking whatever drachma or whatever the fuck it was. Um, and it was just worthless. Every morning you'd come out and go, right, cool, a loaf of bread is now a fucking billion fucking drachma or whatever the fuck. You know, it's like, this is, this is fucking, what do you do in that society, right? Um, and that's again, like you have stuff in like fucking Venezuela or fucking Zimbabwe or anything like, you know, you get hyperinflation right um, and obviously like the fucking Weimar Republic is one of the fucking biggest you know case studies for that um, but he um, how do I go for his beliefs right he basically argued against Keynes he was like oh no government is inefficient government is bad and we should care more about inflation than social policy if that makes sense like don't care about social housing national fucking things. He was like, get the government out of it, right? That's actually his biggest contribution. Like his economic stuff, like it's kind of so-so, like no one would call themselves a Hayekian fucking economist now because like it's not fucking good like economics, right? <laughs> and most people, you, you probably even see people before 2008, they hesitate to call themselves a Keynesian economic, economist um, because of the 1970s, which we'll come to. Um, but basically, to cut a long story short, because Hayek has a very interesting life. Um, he, and as I said, it sounds like conspiracy theories, um, but he basically was like, oh, look, he had a fucking thick, thick, like Germanic accent, Austrian accent. Um, and John Maynard Keynes was a very like personable person, really enthusiastic, really confident, really like, who was it? I think it was Bertrand Russell said that uh, John Maynard Keynes never dimmed his headlights, you know, never dipped his headlights for people. Um, so like, he, he's that kind of person. You know, like the John Maynard Keynes, very like flamboyant out there, really fucking good at like advocating for what he believes, right? Whereas Friedrich Hayek, not so much, right? But Friedrich Hayek did um, organize a ragtag bunch of people that had more, we'll call them conservative beliefs, more right beliefs. Because like John, John Maynard Keynes, he was actually loved by the left, if you want to call it that, like people on the left, because they're like, oh, he's actually created a capitalist system that works, you know, it like stops the low lows. Yeah, okay, it stops the high highs, but it keeps things more even, right? And they're like, there's enough government intervention and you're looking after people. So the left liked him, right? Um, 
However, some classic conservatives, like again, like all the terms get fucking moved around. I'm just gonna say people on the right, some of them didn't like that. They're like, oh, we need less government intervention. We don't want government to be involved at all, right? Anyway, Hayek um, organized a meeting with all of these people. Like he was like, this guy, this guy, this guy, whatever, right? And they met at uh, Mont Pelerin, um, which is in, I wanna say, Austria, but anyway, it's in fucking Europe. Um, and they met there in the Mont Pelerin Society, right? And this sounds like the proper biggest like evil conspiracy fucking thing ever. But basically he organized it so that they could discuss like, how do we, he was like, okay, look, the Keynesians have won right now, right? But he's like, they're gonna fail at some stage, right? And we need to have ourselves organized and have our policies and fucking thoughts put together in a way so that we can capitalize on any failures that they make right and again sounds like this proper like we met in this evil lair in fucking this mountain and discussed like you know monetary policy and how we can fucking move things and as i haven't discussed hayek's beliefs um yet um you might be like oh that's not too bad right but hayek especially as he got older like he was basically this is why he's the the father of the free market and it also if you actually read his stuff like it would definitely piss off people who are supposed advocates of the free market and Friedrich Hayek. Um, Like he believed in proper get rid of governments, right? Like he was like, get rid of borders. He was like, get rid of everything and just let the free market dictate what's going on, right? He was like, cities should be run like corporations. He was like, if you want to move from, like if you don't like, I don't know, fucking Dublin PLC, you don't like how Dublin PLC is run, you don't like the fucking charges they have, the fucking healthcare they offer whatever just fucking move to cork plc you know or whatever fucking two cities he was like cities should just be run like corporations you know like that's what he was an advocate of you know so there's no like build the wall or you know no free movement of people or anything like that he was just like now the market will decide if there's too many people here um the market will sort it out you know and this is kind of this is why i I put that he's that's a a, we'll call it an austrian neoliberal belief right and this is what like even though it doesn't doesn't always get labeled a neoliberal society um or a neoliberal government governance um like the eu is actually a, a neoliberal government government as well um because that's what they believe they're like oh free movement of people like very hayeki and he's like just run them like fucking cities like they're like oh the market will fucking decide it you know let's remove the barriers to finance capital like oh you can move people around oh but you can also move money around right so the eu was set up as a neoliberal organization which you know it doesn't necessarily always get called that um because you also have anglo neoliberalism which is probably a more aggressive form of neoliberalism even though they also have differences in opinion in terms of some of the social beliefs in terms of like they're like let's close the borders like america for example or again, like Brexit with Britain, you know? So like there, there is differences in terms of how they implement those different things, right? Um, but the EU is technically speaking a neoliberal organization, right? Um, that's what they do, even though, again, there are differences, right? Um, so where are we? We're talking about Friedrich Hayek, right? Um, so Hayek, again, really against government intervention, really against like the government fucking do anything, wanted everything to run by a corporation, like just you this limited company or fucking whatever right that's what he was that's probably his greatest in in insight is that government is inefficient and you basically can't trust government right like that's that's his insight right um but it was kind of like people just forgot about that because they were like wow fuck everything is like running really well like he he said for example after world war ii he was like yeah look these fucking planned central economies have been going good like they have been uh working well in britain but we don't want that to continue going because you know it's too much power for the government and they get power hungry and you know it's not good right they're inefficient right because they always are and again he's looking back on this in terms of like this hyperinflation right so he's really scared of inflation and this is why we actually have it inflation pegged especially in america at like two percent or less than two percent and well like fucking that's what they say anyway um like he decided on that number and he was not married to that number he's more so married to just keeping it steady like it could have been five percent right um 
but it just had to stay around that. That's, again, modern monetary policy, which we'll come to in a second. That's kind of, it's based on that, right? Limited government intervention, right? Now, Keynesian economics was fucking working great, right? Fucking led to huge prosperity in America, Britain, whatever. Now, of course, we're also talking about, you know, after the war, there's usually a boom after the war in terms of, you know, the winner takes all, takes the spoils. Um, And, you know, especially if you have something like America who has been like, building fucking lots of stuff and throwing out loans to beat the band like the marshall plan and stuff and um, like there's a lot of money coming in right so things were going fucking good right and that is until the opec oil crisis in the, the 60s 70s right and this is kind of pushed off by israel in, in, to some extent and um, like there's a lot going on in the middle east i'm not gonna fucking touch on it but basically the opec oil they were like no nah, we're not giving you guys oil, right? So there's an oil crisis in, in Britain, in America, in the fucking West, everywhere, right? Um, and again, this is it's, it's somewhat similar to what's happening now in terms of like, we've cut off the supply, right? So there's, you, you might run a car business, you might run a fucking freight hauling business or whatever. Can't do anything now because no oil, right? Like there's, there's they don't have any, right? Um, so fucking unemployment was shot up and people were looking for a way to come out of this slump, right? And people said that Keynesian economics had failed and Keynesian economics had not failed. Governments had failed to implement Keynesian economics. And the reason they had failed to implement it was because, like I said at the start there, when we were talking about Keynes, um, he was like, we should spend when money is cheap, right? And then, you know, cut off that money at the top there when the, the economy is back in order, right? But Again, like you think about this, and this is the problem with all political systems, like humans are fucking corrupt, right? Because all it takes is for a government to go, oh, I have an election coming up, right? Even though money is expensive right now, like the economy is going good, all I'm going to do is borrow money, right? At the top of the economic cycle, which is the exact opposite of the time Keynes said you should borrow it. And then I'm just going to go and say, I'm going to give people free things, right? I'm going to be like, oh, we're investing this money. We're going to fucking do this, right? You basically borrow money, to finance your political campaign because you're in government um, and give people free stuff, right? And Keynes would be completely against that, right? So effectively the economic cycle and the political cycle got out of whack before the 1970s and people believed that Keynes in economics had failed, right? And I believe actually Keynes was dead by this time. I think he died quite young actually. Um, But basically they weren't following what he suggested, right? So people were looking for you know, what to do next. And this kind of enters in uh, Milton Friedman, right? Which is the other person that I wanted to bring in, which kind of comes into this. And this is Milton Friedman is basically the person that married Keynesian thought and Hayekian thought, right? He picked what he thought was the best of both in terms of like Keynesian policies and Hayekian, we'll call it philosophical beliefs in terms of, you know, big government is bad and you know we shouldn't interfere in the free market and you know we should deregulate stuff like that kind of stuff right and um, so he kind of married the two of those things and basically put hayek back on the map right and basically made people start thinking about hayek more again it was triggered by this opec oil crisis and um, but Hi- or, uh, Friedman was the one that really fucking put Hayek back up there. Because before that, like he might have been meeting in this fucking Mont Pelerin society with his fucking utter evil, you know, whatever people, but people had forgotten about him. They're like Keynesian economics, that's the way forward, right? Um, now, the OPEC oil crisis, that led to two people, which is kind of what we need to discuss when we talk about um, the food environment and stuff. And this is Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, right? Now, Ronald Reagan actually was a trained economist, but he's actually a pre-Keynesian economist, as far as I'm aware, um, in terms of like his education, like the the college he studied that wasn't a Keynesian thing, but he also was afraid of flying. So he used to go on the train to go to different places. And so he used to just read economics books during that time. And someone who he really liked was Hayek right? Um, so he read a lot of Hayek, right? The other person, and again, same time, Maggie Thatcher, and um, which obviously if you're in Britain or Ireland, like, you know, a lot about that. If you're on the fucking Falkland Islands, you know a lot about that too. Um, but Maggie Thatcher, um, another person that these are the two people that we need to talk about when we're talking about the changing food environment, right? They're the ones, these are classic neoliberals, right? Because Hayek, the, 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 like, 
Milton Friedman, actually his policies have more in, 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 in common with Keynes. However, from a philosophical point of view, like if you're talking about pure economics, like Keynes and Friedman, they're probably the most similar, right? But if we're talking about overall political and philosophical beliefs, like Hayek and Friedman are more similar, right? Um, so they obviously get lumped in together, right? And Maggie and Reagan were fucking big fans of Hayek's work, right? Like Maggie used to carry around uh, the Constitution of Liberty by Hayek, right? And the Constitu Constitution of Liberty was basically Hayek's book on where the line is between how much the government should intervene and how much they should step back, right? And like, what should they do basically um, before overstepping the line into, you know, this is big government, this is too much government, right? And um, so the two of them heavily influenced by Hayek and heavily influenced by Milton Friedman to a lesser extent. And also like if you follow current uh, economists, like I'm actually a big fan of Thomas L, even though I don't actually like Hayekian or Friedman to an extent um, policies, my policies are fucking complex. Um, but uh, Thomas L, he's actually a fucking, he was trained by Friedman, you know, and um, like Milton Friedman was literally his, his boss and his fucking mentor, right? Um, so like, again, like you can see how certain lines of thought travel through different people, right? Um, so they in influenced, or they introduced a lot of policies in the 60s, 70s onwards. And like, I think Maggie Thatcher was in power for fucking 13 years, I wanna say. And Ronald Reagan was in for eight years. Um, and he had some fucking hilarious speeches, like when a fucking balloon popped um, during one of the speeches. He's like, ha, miss me. Um, sounded like gunfire, you know? Um, but uh, anyway, um, these two were the ones that implemented neoliberal policies. And they're the ones that really started this transition from neoliberal or from a more Keynesian style of governance um, to a more neoliberal style of governance, right? Um, and I just want to say at this point, right? Like this is not a left or right thing because obviously Reagan and Maggie Thatcher were right, right? Ever since the two of them, every government in America or Britain have been a neoliberal government. It doesn't matter if they're on the left, they say they're labor or they say they're fucking Democrats or fucking whatever. They are a neoliberal government through and through, right? Like both Bushes, for example, they were neoliberals, right? Clinton, definitely a neoliberal, right? Neoliberal through and through. Obama, definitely a neoliberal as well, right? Like Donald Trump, a little bit different in terms of like he has more or had a more of a like an isolationist, protectionist, America first, you know, anti-globalist um, type of government, um, which they're not really neoliberal policies, but obviously like parts of his government were also neoliberal in terms of how they fucking advocated for different tax cuts for different industries and businesses and stuff like that, right? Um, and then Biden is just Clinton era, politics with a side order of dementia um but that's basically he's going he's just going to be a neoliberal through and through as well right and like especially as we, we come to discussing the uh the nutrition stuff like we, we you can't knock neoliberalism in terms of its effectiveness right like it's been very effective right it's also been very effective in basically quashing political dissent like think about like before neoliberalism like if you were on the left for example you used to have people like they're literally talking about like minor strikes and you know unionization and different stuff like that right and nowadays people don't do that stuff right they're just like oh i got a fucking i don't know fucking uh, a facebook picture that goes over my picture whatever the fuck those are called you know like they're like oh i i support this like you look at all the fucking corporations and stuff like they basically have monopolized um we'll, we'll call it a uh, social issues right like you'll see like i don't know fucking different twitter place different twitter or different companies on twitter like they'll change their fucking banner to uh i don't know the pride flag for example right they'll do that in western countries but then they won't do it in islamic countries for example because they're like oh well i know it'll make us money in these western countries but it's not going to make us money here so like they don't actually believe in that nike is a good example as well like they, in america they're all like oh social justice we really care about slavery like they literally hired colin uh, kaepernick or however the fuck you say his name um, and again i'm not saying i'm against any of this stuff like um but i'm just saying like this this is what they do um and they're, they're really, they, they push that method message of like social justice in America, but then they literally have like slave labor camps. They use them in fucking China, you know? So it's like, what, like, 
well, how do you have these two fucking beliefs, right? Um, but again, it's because they are like neoliberal companies. They don't fucking care about the actual beliefs. They're just commoditizing that outrage or they, they know it'll make them money. Like it'll move, move fucking product. That'll get them fucking profit and they'll deal with any of the fucking fallout after that, right? Um, so again, like it's not just like governments that get swayed by neoliberalism, like companies do as well because it's fucking successful at what it does, right? Um, but anyway, so just again, I wanted to say, what did I want to say here? Um, yeah, so it's not left or right. Again, all governments, like especially in somewhere like Ireland, like Ireland has actually the shittest politics of fucking anywhere because we basically have like all centrist parties. Like they're just all fucking centrist parties and all of them are also shit centrist parties. It's like they literally were like, all right, we could pick all the good stuff from the left or the right and, you know, mash them together or whatever. They were like, nah, let's not do that. Let's just pick all the shit stuff, right? And that's effectively how they govern, right? Um, and like we have, like people talk about wealth inequality in different countries. Um, Ireland has the biggest, well, I, I say that, that's a hyperbole, has one of the biggest wealth inequalities in terms of like how the economy especially after this coronavirus stuff like how the, the a k-shaped economy is going like if you look at like average gdp in ireland like absolutely reckless compared to the average national wage right like no other country would have that big of a gap right like if you look at the average industrial wage for example in ireland i think it's like 30k where our gdp is like 55 60k right and it's like there's a fucking like huge gap right and that's you're not supposed to have that big of a fucking gap like you, like someone's obviously making a lot of fucking money in ireland to raise our gdp that much if like there's only fucking whatever six million people or something in ireland like you know so there's a lot of money being made somewhere in ireland and we basically have this like k-shaped economy but anyway that's beside the point um <clears throat> so yeah basically right we get to the seventies, right? This is when neoliberalism really starts to take the fore. And that's all I really wanted to talk about in terms of like the historical, political, social context for it, so that we can actually talk about the transition of nutrition then after this, right? Um, because a lot changed from the seventies onwards. Like if you plot like the obesity, the increase in obesity, it basically starts the same time Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher take power like that's that's the start of it so you need to understand all the stuff we went through in this podcast to actually understand the policies and stuff that are put in place by them that then influence the nutrition transition which we'll talk about in the next episode but also it really is important to understand that stuff when we are discussing like going forward in terms of like government policy individual thoughts beliefs and stuff in terms of how we actually deal with the obesity epidemic you know and that's obviously stuff we've been talking about in terms of like is it more regulation that we need in the the, the marketplace is that what's going to help is it less regulation like and again you you have to have the cultural historical political context for that to actually be able to understand how do we go about tackling this issue right um and effectively like i want to in the next episode at least like i want to tackle the the question of like does the statement the freer the market the more obese the people hold true and if that is the case like does that mean that we're against the free market right because like ronald reagan and well i should say actually hayek was the one who literally was like the free market that's free market capitalism that's hayek basically right so where do we go from here right what's all of that stuff all the stuff we just talked about is what's influencing our thoughts and ideas in terms of how we go forward with this right and it's interesting especially after the 2008 financial crisis where people really started going back to keynesian law like i should say like i don't agree with modern monetary policy but that's a, a far bigger fucking that's not something i can fucking discuss on a podcast um but they've kind of moved back to Keynesian economics and they've definitely um, moved away from what they thought, which was like austerity. Like austerity has to be the fucking stupidest thing ever. And I'm not going to get into all the ins and outs of that, but it's proper fucking stupid. Um, but anyway, look, does that make sense, Gary? I've just been fucking chatting for like fucking however long this podcast is. An hour and a half or something. <laughs> uh, yes. I think that if you were to 
kind of sum up the the question that we have to ask that we'll obviously get into in the next episode or or the consideration rather it's that when you look at um neoliberal economic policy you can kind of think of it as being really good but it depends on your question it depends what you're like the next question is for what so you can say that there's a lot of benefits that come in certain um, areas like for example if you were to uh, pull a country out of starvation there might be benefits there from the neoliberal side however there's trade-offs there's externalities you know and these are the things that we need to discuss um if we're going to have you know a nice well-functioning healthy society and in this case that that trade-off or one of the trade-offs relates to health another trade-off and this is one of the reasons that it's not strictly a left versus right thing at all because a lot of conservatives would say that the neoliberal economic policy has basically destroyed beauty you know beauty in society and stuff like um religious architecture and all those types of things that when you look at a city and you say that there's something here that's more than just what we can write down on paper from a monetary perspective or that we can even describe in words things like music art etc all of those things are valued by both people on the right and people on the left and those things also get destroyed where you basically get this kind of hegemonic value system where we all sort are expected to value the same things and that's not exactly how values have always been derived over time so the architecture one, just on that the architecture one is actually the clearest like visual representation because yeah. you can see the, the shift like imagine you go to like countries that have had like a you know, deep cultural fucking whatever like you go to somewhere i don't know in germany for example and you go to this little village and stuff you're like oh man you know you're in a german village or like a germanic village you know and um, where you go to somewhere in i don't know france you're like oh these look like french buildings you know you go to different countries and you see like, oh these look like i don't know turkish buildings or fucking whatever like there's every country has its own style and its own like you know mm-hmm. character right whereas with neoliberalism they're like now globalization baby let's make everywhere look homogenous right like it's like Box skyscrapers buildings. boxes fucking like you look at you know modern architecture like that's like it's disgusting i'm sorry if any of you are a fucking architect right and um, it's fucking disgusting right um whereas you look at like other like older buildings it's like this is beautiful like you look at like georgian architecture you walk around dublin or something like you look at the georgian architecture like this is fucking beautiful right now obviously it's oppression it represents oppression in ireland but the buildings themselves are fucking beautiful yeah and um, but you, you know what i mean like so there, there is a a character that is lost right and like you said like i don't think that's a left or right thing you know like that's not a a political thing i think we can all agree that fucking modern architecture is fucking disgusting yeah absolutely and uh, and i mean like the, the the thing is like if you if you follow people who are kind of like true old school like hardcore leftists and you tra- follow true conservatives like both of them will point at the kind of typical neoliberal ideology and say this is dumb <laughs> whereas generally you have conversations within that kind of uh, doctrine that are supposedly right versus left but it's like yeah you're kind of talking about what color to paint the wall rather than whether or not the wall should exist really is, is kind of what it comes down to yeah like i always think of it like conservatives i'm like what are you conserving like like what, what are yeah. you, like, like letting jobs resources money flow to multinationals you know at the expense of people's health especially like that's what we're talking about in terms of this obesity stuff that we've been talking about like how is that a fucking good idea for a functioning society like it's not a good idea at all right and then libertarians they're like don't tread on me like that's what their their whole fucking thing is especially like right-leaning libertarians they're like you know don't tread on me like they have the fucking you know yellow flag with a snake and whatever um and they do that when they're talking about the government but then as soon as you talk about multinational like corporations they're like oh yeah. yes <laughs> tread on me harder daddy like what, like what the fuck like this makes no fucking sense and you can actually see it now in terms of the discussion around like donald trump getting banned from twitter you know like people are literally just like oh yeah government or these multinational companies they're allowed to do whatever the fuck they want right you know, again like you might agree with that you might disagree with it um but at the same time it's like do we really want to give all these like these multinational companies more power like it's probably not a fucking good idea right um, and obviously we'll talk about that kind of stuff with regard to health like i'm not gonna get into an actual fucking political discussion here yeah. right and then like liberals like if you, you talk about like american liberals in terms of like i say american liberals like that's because that's what they call them like left-leaning people like again i was like use the example earlier on like 
they scream about like oppression and different things and um, like social issues and um, which again like we need that in society we need someone fucking you know ringing the bell telling us what's fucking going on um but then they'll literally turn around and say oh yes this is fucking great twitter banned fucking donald trump you know um this is great i love when multinational companies you know fucking interfere with our uh, politics you know or again as i said they'll literally support companies that are antithetical to their actual beliefs like i used the nike example earlier on it's like what the fuck? And obviously, I know I'm caricaturing all of the fucking policies here. Um, and obviously, again, if we talk about Marxism or fucking communism, it's like, yeah, okay, maybe that actually does have a solution for the obesity epidemic because everyone fucking starves. But anyway, yep. I have fucking not much else to say in terms of that because I did want to just lay the framework for the actual discussion that we wanted to have in the next podcast um, and yeah i think that did lay the framework because there's a lot of stuff that i do want to cover in terms of like people talk about having a free market but you know talk about like grain subsidies for example right and um, like p- there has been successful government intervention even if you are a small government advocate you know for example like the sugar tax in the uk right and then the reformulation of products to you know basically avoid that sugar tax right and um, so, like, there, there is stuff that we needed to discuss in this to lay the framework to be able to discuss the next episode, right? The part two of this, right? So, uh, yeah, I've literally nothing else to say. Um, the only thing else is to actually get stuck into the uh, the actual nutrition stuff, the nutrition transition stuff. Yeah. So, in the next episode, we will give you an idea about how all of this impacts nutrition because it is quite interesting. Like as we said, like a, a lot of the the neoliberal uh, policy or ideology leads to this kind of uh, just standard architecture, as you say, in different cities or even standard values held by different people. But you'll also see that it leads to basically standardized nutrition across the world as well. And it's one of the reasons that even using the phrase Western diet doesn't really have any meaning anymore or the standard American diet, because it's basically becoming a worldwide uh, neoliberal diet. Um, some people have even referred to it as. So in the next episode, we'll introduce you know, some examples. Uh, there are some good examples of where this has happened in, uh, as you said earlier, developing countries. Um, and you can see countries at different stages of this. And it's potentially more of an issue for some of those uh, low middle income countries, because if you were to think about healthcare infrastructure, if you've got lower healthcare infrastructure and you've got all of the obesity and diabetes, et cetera, of more developed countries, like that's a recipe for disaster because there's still a residual burden of infectious diseases in those countries as well. So it's a mess and that's hopefully something we can get into in the next podcast. So yes so Gary where can people find us do all that stuff interact with us because I know we have coaching spaces available we do have coaching spaces available and as some of you will be aware from following us we just brought on a new coach as well our nutritionist Mr. Brian Ohengasa and he is also taking on clients at the moment so we will be taking on um our exclusive coaching clients. Um, if you're someone that fits the bill, uh, that's full training, nutrition, lifestyle, rehab, whatever your needs are. Um, we'll, if you want to get in touch, uh, just reach out, uh, drop us a DM on Instagram, drop us an email or whatever, and we'll see if you're a good fit for our kind of full coaching program. If you're someone that's just in, interested in nutrition, maybe you're working on your relationship with food, your training's fine, or maybe you just want to fuel your your CrossFit or your weightlifting or whatever that you're training away with, uh, and Brian can really help you out with that as well. Um, other than that, uh, we do obviously have the coach's corner. So if you're a coach, you want to you know get on your education game, you want to have new content to constantly be feeding on, it will be worth getting involved in the coach's corner. As the weeks and months go on, that content is basically accumulating so that it would take you quite a while to catch up with it all um but we would recommend you know when you do sign up you know pick one subject and kind of work through those lectures take some notes and then ask us questions it's a great way to go about it so get involved you can subscribe to that below um we do obviously have our newsletter that goes out each week, so make sure to subscribe to that. You can also join our Facebook group, the Triage Method Community. Ask us some questions in there. Um, if you have thoughts on the podcast, podcast ideas, etc., we'd love for you to interact. And that goes for social media too. You know, if you're following us on social media, feel free to you know ask me and Patty questions. Same goes for Brian. If we're posting things you're interested in, um, then you know 
comment, let us know, ask us questions. We're more than happy uh, to help you out when we can. So me, Skinny Gaz, we've obviously got the triage, a triage method, the real Paddy Farrell for Paddy, and then Brian O'Hengesa. You might want to look that one up because his name's a bit difficult. <laughs> he, needs to, he needs to change his name name just for the for search I've been purposes. advocating for him um, name too, but, like the English version Brian Hennessy that's what <laughs> yeah so look uh, follow all those pages uh, on Instagram and you can do the same uh, on Facebook follow the triage method Facebook follow the triage method YouTube or subscribe um, to the triage method YouTube and I think that's everywhere uh, you'll find us yeah absolutely phenomenal anyway it is literally too easy and I cannot wait to get into the next episode.